um, and how well they communicate their needs. Now, when you see the, when you see the developmental milestones and benchmarks for some of the when you're for your students and for your children, you start to wonder what is an executive function? Is that a weak is it a weakness or is that a disability? So I want to kind of differentiate our conversation and start with that. Um, when I work with parents and students, and I didn't give you a lot of my background, but I should probably start with that. So Cindy um, and I worked at Charles Armstrong School together. We we were classroom teachers, and then we developed professional and friendship, professional friendship as well. Um, I stayed at Armstrong for about eight years, and I was the manager of the research development um, in the curriculum instruction department, and then I opened up a a charter school in San Francisco called, called Gateway Middle School. I don't know if some of you have heard about Gateway. Um, and so I was the founding director for special education in that school. Um, and then after that, I went to, um, I was a learning specialist over at Menlo School on Valparaiso. And then my latest stint is um, I'm the director for the Village Jewish High School. Um, I'm the, the director for the Center for Learning Success. Right? Right, um, um, they did like. So, so that's my professional role. Um, I also then went back and got my master's in, in special education and my teaching credential in special education, and I got my doctorate from the University of San Francisco in the learning and instruction with a concentration in special education. And I also taught in the different schools of ed um, in the University of San Francisco State, University of San Francisco, and my latest one was at Stanford for the STEM program. So I can honestly say I taught from kindergarten all the way to graduate school. And the one of the blessing was that I actually have one student who I taught in my class in fifth grade. Um, and her dad is my accountant. And so she, he told me that he's going back to school, or she is back to school at Notre Dame getting her special education credential. And she actually took my class, you know, one time. So it was really nice to see the progression and to feel old again. <laughs> so this is dating me, right? So I also witness the growth and development. So I also am a mom. I have four kids. I have four, I had four kids under in five years. So it's crazy making. So um and my third um child actually has learning differences. He has visual processing issues and I didn't even recognize it until I was finishing my master's, right? Um, and then my other son has, is on the spectrum as well. So as luck would have it, they don't all come with an operating manual, right? So you just work it and go step by step by step. And I really admire that you all are here because I was also in your seat trying to learn and trying to figure out what I can do as a parent. Um, and just love it. It's great. I love, and I found really my calling and my passion around working with students and working with, I think I'm a better teacher because I'm a mom, and I'm a better mom because I'm a teacher. So those kinds of realizations, I like to pass on to other people too. So um, I have a lot of compassion and empathy for the will and the drive to support the young and be involved in the schools. Um, so, as you take care of them and you move them off to the <coughs> educational environment, education really is a, learning is a social cultural context. There's a, there's a context around how students learn, right? There's the, um, you know, there's a lot of talk right now about like, perseverance, right? And mindsets, fixed mindsets versus growth mindsets and such, right? Um, yes, those are all real, those are all real at home, and those are also all real at, in, in the school place. Academic behaviors, it's really making sure they, they come to school on time, that they have the materials, that they have their homework, that they turn in their homework, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, and um, especially in the middle school, six, seven, and eight, that they advocate for themselves. If I don't know what I don't know, how will I do my homework? 
So that's all part of executive function. Um, and then the academic performance, social skills, especially in middle school. If you don't have that, it's not fun. It's not going to be a fun year for you in middle school. And so that's also part of executive function. Knowing how to use rich learning strategy is executive function also. But I also place this slide in here to make a point that yes, it does start at home, but it is the responsibility of the schools to enable, to grow executive functioning, with executive functioning skills within their school, within their curriculum, within their social emotional learning program. Does that make sense? So, anyway, so, so what I'd like to do is really introduce an integrated perspective of executive function. I have to be honest, in confessions of a in a special educator here, when I first started learning and, and researching, and actually my research is executive functioning and writing, um, when I first started learning about executive functioning and, and my interest got peaked, it was just about the prefrontal cortex for me. Right? It was just that. And I didn't even take a look at all the other systems of the brain and how interconnected it is, and that without the other, the, pre, the prefrontal cortex cannot do its job. So what I'd like for you to do is just raise your hand. Okay. So open up your hands. And so how many of you guys have heard of Dan Siegel? Dan's model of the brain, right? So right here is the brainstem. Yeah? And this is the mammalian brain, the primitive brain. So let's go ahead and put your finger, your thumb right here, and that's your limbic system. And you want to close your fingers right there. So this is your hand model of the brain, right? And so right here, so this whole thing right here is the cortex. So it's the newest part of the brain that's just recently evolved, yeah? So when it is functioning well, yes, it can do its job around invading all the other parts of the brain. And this part right here, this little part right here is called the prefrontal cortex. So all of the things that we'll be talking about lies in the front of our brain right here. But underneath all of this is the limbic system. And who knows what the limbic system is in charge of? Emotions, right? Emotion regulation. And so when a child is in fear and cannot understand his or her and cannot process his emotions, right? The primitive brain take, takes over. The prefrontal cortex can't even perform at all, much less any executive, do any executive function <clears throat> yet. So it needs to be addressed before any cognitive behavior strategies can be put in place. Right? When we're scared and we're not feeling safe, we fight, we fly, we freeze. Right? And so for those of us who understand that intimately and are still working on it, you know, on how to control fight, fight, freeze, what about our kids when they're K through eight? They have no if we don't set that up for them, then they have no tools. The mammalian brain is used to fight, fight, freeze, and if we do not, through attention and focus, if we do not cultivate those skills, executive functioning will not go. Right? And research shows that these things can be cultivated. Brain research, there's epigenetics nowadays, right? Neuroplasticity. Epigenetics is the is the way the brain regenerates its cells. And actually, for aerobic exercise. <laughs> so if you want to grow your brain cells, go and do some aerobic exercises. Richie Davidson, that's his research out of University of Wisconsin-Madison. He talks about how the Dalai Lama, you know, walks on his treadmill, right? The master meditator. So executive functioning can be taught, can be cultivated, and 
together with your schools and building bridges with your schools, with your teachers, you guys can team together to make sure that your child understands what it means to be organized, to be planful, to emotionally regulate yourself. Okay. So we talked about this part of the hand model of the brain and the of the cortex. So symbolically, it's the maestro. It's the one that makes sure that the integrated framework of the complexity of the brain works together and plays music. It's also um, likened to an air traffic controller. Um, it has to manage many different tasks all at the same time. And because we have learned that skill, we take it for granted. It's kind of mindless around that stuff. But in today's society, we need to be more focused and aware and attentive to the things that our students are doing and they're asked to do. So we need to be there outside executive function or orchestra traffic controller. And really the session is coaching you back to do that, right? This is coaching the coaches, training the trainer. Um, and so that's what I would like. My intent is for you guys to leave here to know what skill you want to work on for your students, what you're going to do with your environment to change it a little bit and then get a different result. What was that that Einstein said? I think it was Einstein. Yeah. So doing the same thing over and over again, expecting the same thing is a different result is insanity. Mm -hmm. So we're not going to be insane when we leave here. You're going to identify one thing that you're going to change and you're going to observe. And you're going to be kind to yourself because you can't make changes right away, right? Mm -hmm. So it's just one thing and check in. And you know, create some parent networks and make sure that you're, you've got some companions along this journey. All right, your turn. Talk too much. Um, on your in your handout, please turn to the page where it says activity one. You only need a pencil, writing the pencil. Well, this is companion notes, not the PowerPoint slides, right? But you want to look at the, this one. The one that has all my answers. <laughs> it's a grid. That says activity one at the top. Write the number of the executive function still next to it. All right, guys. Can someone tell me what they need to do? You get a map. Are you going to write the number? The number of the executive function still next to its definition. Um, here, the ability to create a roadmap. <laughs> to reach a goal. What was that? <laughs> Planning and prioritization. So that was four. Yeah? Okay. The ability to stand back and five. take a bird's eye view. Five. Five. Metacognition. <coughs> Number five. The ability to hold information in your mind while performing complex tasks. Three. 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 Working memory. Right? The ability to revise in the face of obstacles, setbacks yeah. is what? Yeah. Flexibility. Yeah. Yes. Eleven. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. Capacity to maintain attention to a situation or task in spite of distractibility, fatigue, or boredom. Sustained attention. The ability to begin a task without undue procrastination in a timely fashion is task initiation. Yes. Ability to design and maintain systems for keeping track of information or materials. Organization. Capacity to have a goal, follow through com and the completion of the goal. Goal directed persistence, ability to manage emotions in order to achieve goals, complete tasks, or control and direct behavior. Control. Um, capacity to think before you act, capacity to delay or inhibit responding by the sub ability to evaluate multiple factors. One. And the last one is. Capacity to estimate how much time one has, how to allocate, and how to stay within time limits and deadlines. I don't know about you, but I saw a couple areas that I needed to work on as well, um, especially the emotional regulation part. Um, so it's it's a human condition. <laughs> um, I think it's great to be able to identify specific areas so we don't overwhelm ourselves and our students. Um, when I used to write IEP goals and I ran IEP meetings and such, um, 
research specialist with really like five different goals and I or ten even. It's just so much to keep track of it and we're driving the kid crazy. So we just need to really select and be mindful of what we do around uh, to cultivate the learning, because it is a learning piece, right? Learning is, has um, stimuli, so you've got to figure out the environment and what it looks like and, and set the student up for success. <clears throat> so you don't want the student feeding their homework in, in the kitchen in front of a TV, feeling that it, it's a little bit distracting. Right? Okay. Um, let's see. Oh. It does develop over time. So I want to bring your attention to this. Um, Page three of nine. Page three of nine. So these are the normal developmental paths for each age range. And so, so this is just a, a quick overview of what kids in these age range can do. Um, you know, by grade three to five, these, these kids should be able to run some errands and tidy up the bedroom. That's a big one for me. Right? Or the playroom. Put your toys away. You know, put the green toys in the green bucket, put the red toys in the red bucket, or something. Some sort of organization, right? Pack up your backpack, put them over by the door, do the checklist. Those are some things that should be normally be able to be performed. Um, so this is really handy to just keep in mind when you're kind of going crazy and trying to figure out who you should be able to do this or they should be able to do this. So <coughs> have a, just have a look just to kind of get you settled into what is for a normal. Is this helpful? Yeah? Okay. okay. So at this point, we'll go ahead and um, I'm going to have you view. This is, I now go into the Harvard University Center for Development and Life. We do a lot of great research on the federal function of resilience. Um, thanks to them, we actually have these two handouts that um, came from their research on how to have executive functioning, um, how to <coughs> incorporate executive functioning activities um, with your kiddos, right? Ages, age appropriate as well, seven to 12 and five to seven. If these are great, so if, and if you want the younger to more, um, like the three, zero to three, there's more in there as well. So have a look at the center for on the, on the development line. Okay. All right. So let's go ahead and have a look. This is about five minutes. Science tells us that brains, minds, are built, not born. And at the center of this dynamic architecture, are a set of skills called executive function and self-regulation. Children's self-regulation and executive function are key ingredients in their lifetime performance. It's not just about learning language or learning numbers or learning colors. We have to be able to work effectively with others, with distractions, with multiple demands, these actually are skills that contribute to the productivity of the American workforce. Educators, I think, are, are looking for just this sort of thing. And when we describe what we mean by executive function, they say, yes, that's it. That's exactly you know, the problem. These kids, they can tell me these rules, but they can't actually use them. What is executive function? Probably the best way to think about it is sort of like an air traffic control system in the brain. Just like an air traffic control system has to manage lots of airplanes going on, lots of runways, and really exquisite timing, and so on. A child has to manage a lot of information, avoid distraction. <coughs> We really think of it as involving working memory and inhibitory control and mental flexibility. Take a situation where a child is having to take turns. So first of all, the child has to have inhibitory control. The child has to be able to stop whatever he or she is doing and let the other child take a turn. 
But when it's your turn again, you also have to remember what it is you're supposed to be doing. So why hold on working memory? If the children who are taking the turns after you do something unpredictable, you have to be able to adjust what you're going to do next. And that requires mental flexibility. Children who are struggling with these capacities um, often look like children who just aren't paying attention or children who are deliberately not controlling themselves. If you don't have self-regulation, you act out and the teacher puts you in time out and so then you miss part of the learning that's going on and then you are more upset because you're behind and so you act out and so you get this downward spiral. How does executive function develop? Seven, seven, and plus four. In little children, and even you know, in infant and toddler years, you begin to see the roots of executive functioning skill. What's going on in our brains is unbelievably intricate and complicated. The prefrontal cortex, or the front third of the brain, is important for executive function. But it's more than just prefrontal cortex. This region doesn't act alone. It's involved in controlling your behavior through its interactions with all other parts of the brain. The brain goes from a situation where you've got nearest neurons communicating very strongly with each other and ignoring the rest of the brain to these widespread networks that are connecting these different areas. Executive function changes over the life course. It improves radically over the first few years. Uh, it continues to improve throughout adolescence. It's not until early adulthood that you have the adult-type networks that are very strongly activated that connect different brain regions together. Let's take notes. Also, we believe that executive functions can be trained. It's just like going to the gym. So the more you practice in these areas, the stronger the capacity is likely to become because you're helping to strengthen those neural connections. Mom, you're at 24. Slowly but surely, you're going to be able to step back and that child's going to go into the world with these skills where they can get along with other people, change rules, and they can be flexible, and they can accomplish new things, and they're unafraid. If we don't learn these skills, during the childhood and adolescent years when they're coming online, we are really ill-equipped as an adult to hold a job, to maintain a marriage, <laughs> to raise children, to get along with each other, to basically be part of a civil society. issues which she'll, you know, she'll compensate for. This is really an organization task. You ready, Veronica? Sure. 
So before you begin, and so you're you're gonna read directions, <laughs> organization. We're gonna read directions designed to help you understand your child's day to day experience. Every child's experience is unique. But we're gonna see how Ron's experience is this, okay? Yes. No, you're going. They just want to observe you. So have a look. But how does it feel to be a child or two who has trouble planning and prioritizing? Go for it. Okay, so she has Are you ready? Use the bucket to catch the falling shapes. Mm -hmm. Use the bucket. Grab the bucket. Now catch only circles. Move the bucket. 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 Move Jarring. Um, thank you. You're a great sport. <laughs> I wasn't very good sport. We tried it earlier. Okay, so okay, despite the technology issue, what is the organization task called for by that activity? Just shut it up. Coordination. Coordination? What else? Flexibility. Flexibility? In what way? You can your, um, yeah. Right? Yeah. Very good. Speed? Yes. What else? Visual. Visual? Visual? Yes. What else? Perception. Perception? Yes. Right? And so you also have to listen to say, okay, now catch, move the bucket to just catch the squares or catch the circles and such, right? And so, and there's also a time thing. And then talk about but flight, bright, flight, freeze. I mean, that buzzing is just jarring, and who's going to want to perform with that one, right? So, thank you, Ron. Okay, now let's move on to our next slide. Okay, what do you observe that? Okay, so here's the here's the reading, um, here's the reading simulation. Okay, so these are all the executive function stuff that you need to have when you're looking at reading. So now look at page five of nine. Well, if I could have another volunteer, please. Thank you. I know, Veronica is all traumatized now. Um, so we're going to have to do some re reparations. We're going to repair our relationship as a problem. Um, can I have a volunteer, please, to read this salmon? We got everybody's terrified. Anyone just tell me? The mystery of how salmon can find their way back to their home rivers is salt. The salmon navigates by sun and stars when traveling in the ocean. When the salmon nears the general area of the river in which it was born, it uses its nose. The salmon can remember the smell of the home river that it left as a baby. Thank you. How is working memory needed in this activity? What do you think? How is working memory needed in this activity? Actually, let me go back. Are there vocabulary words that I should have pre taught? Right? Like? Navigate. Right? Um, you know, traveling in the ocean, right? It uses its nose. Oh, Sammy says so not, you know. I mean, for a little kid, they're not going to understand that. Um, I was trained in the Swinerland method, and so the one thing that I love that the Swinerland really contributed to the field is this routine called prep for reading, where we as teachers would pull out phrases and, and, and really read it out loud to the students. And then give the meaning so that I'm priming the brain to really build on those phrases and then the meaning of the phrase and then the meaning of the phrase within the sentence. Right? So take a look at the first sentence um, the mystery of how salmon can find their way back to their home river is solved. Right? Usually it's like the salmon is, right? I mean, that's a very complicated set of sentences. And so for the student to really remember all of that, that's a working memory capacity in terms of chunking the information. Right? So for working memory, 
a great strategy is chunking it. Right? Don't give the student uh, you know, this entire paragraph. Start with a sentence first. And I was also trained in Linda Mudell, um, visualizing, verbalizing, right? And so what do they do? Where we were trained to really take a look at <coughs> how do they think the salmon looks like? Is it orange? Is it red? Is it green? What do they think it looks like? Okay. I also, as a teacher, needed to be very culturally responsive and sensitive to my students. How do I know my students, you know, saw, know what a salmon looks like? Right? Yeah, exactly. So I think um, the graphic below looks at the little the components of reading comprehension. And when you have a great decoder, I don't understand why my kids are not passing the grade in fourth grade or fifth grade. They're really a good reading. Well, the job of K through three and K through two is really decoding. It's really just reading these things out loud. It's, you know, so by the time they get to the higher grade, they have to make meaning. So there are, those are two separate things that involve executive functioning as well. Um, so before you leave this evening, um, take a picture of me. I brought some handy dandy tools that I actually use for my practice and my research. Um, have a look at these. These are, I brought this for reading comprehension because it's critical in the elementary years. So have a look at that. Um, and then the, a more researchy book on executive functioning here would be great too. Okay. So these are things that, you know, at 2 o'clock in the morning when you have insomnia. Maybe like a big change of brain. Okay. Yeah. All right. Moving on. Activity three. So this is an um, assignment that I took out of the Achieve the Core website. And Achieve the Core is, um, is, is an organization that helps all of our all of the teachers in California teach to um, understand what the common core is. And so have a look at this. And this was taken out of grade the grade two level. Alright, so here's the assignment. Just read it to yourself. Mark it up, annotate it, and see how easy a grade two student can do this. What prerequisite skills are assumed to be mastered? <coughs> can I have a volunteer? What, what do you think about this assignment? Yes, thank you. Like grade two at all board. <laughs> right? I know. It seems in some of those, but the second grade will answer it. Seriously, I know. That was great too. Yep. I mean, that's the stuff that our teachers are giving to our students, right? In the post. So, let's take a look. What executive functioning skills that were needed? What, what do you need to do here first? Yes, ma'am. Working memory. She's referring to something that happened days ago. Yes, and it, exactly. And if you have sustained, if you can have sustained attention, right? Good luck. Right? Even um, the vocabulary is a lot. Right. For many, right. right. I want. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yes. Grammar. Yes, sir. My research in yes, my research in writing. You need to go back. To, it's a multifaceted skill. Some people can't uh, generate ideas. Some people can generate ideas because they don't really even know how to unpack the problems. It's complicated. And they have to write a narrative or an argumentation paper or a, an, an explanatory paper. That's what the Common Core says you need to learn by grade eight. Yep. So, and you have to do that in, and you have to do that in math and right and science now too. So, it's our teachers are great though. They love to teach and so they're working super hard. So I think as parents, you really need to partner with them. You really need to partner with them. Um, it says write a paragraph with at least five sentences describing the characteristics of a butterfly. Use evidence from the text, right? Graphic organizers. Graphic organizers, right? And so those are some things that you don't go right into writing your paragraph right away. That's just planning. It's planning and, or, planning and organization, right? It's planning and organization isn't just about catching a bucket, you know, on, <laughs> on the technology and, you know, for us to do well in this assignment. So you have to plan 
how to write it, what the butterfly is, and all of that information. So scaffold it. If anything else, chunk information. Break it into parts. Okay. Does that make sense? Oh. Oh, that is the There's my lady. Okay. So this is where we get into a schema. I love concept maps because the brain works better in terms of putting working memory into long-term memory. If you create mind maps, if you create concept maps, and I actually, my dissertation was on teaching academic vocabulary to sixth grade students with and without disabilities and how it impacts writing. And the main um, significant effects that I got were the students who did concept maps did a lot better, especially my students with learning disabilities, did a lot better in their writing products. So always, always use concept maps. And so there are two things you need to remember when you're creating an intervention, right? Or you're going to cultivate your executive functioning skill. You know, look at the environment. What about the environment? If you're, you know, if you're asking your student to be working um, where you can see the student, you don't want to put a TV in front of that, or you want to take the phone away, or or not do any things on the board. Like we always advise teachers not to put too many things around because it's too distracting. Make sense? Um, and then you want to change or adapt the social um, environment. So, for example, you want to be able to um, monitor the social interactions, right? When you're trying to grow so, um, social reciprocity, and you want to monitor that, and you want to say, okay, so Joe gets along with Susie, but doesn't get along with Tommy, so I got to take a look at what the difference is, what's triggering the student, yes? And then you got to modify the task. And then you've, you've got to provide some routines and cues. Executive functioning, live self-regulation, the concept of self-regulation means that the student needs to be, as individuals, thrive and integrate in our brain better if we're queued up, right? And then at the point when we no longer need to queue it up, it's because we've internalized the routine, okay? So that's the environment. And then the individual, it's look at the way you're coaching. Um, you gotta define the challenge behavior. Don't put three goals because then you can't measure the progress. So Joey needs to have some successes, right? So you need to tell her you're doing great. So now let's move on to and actually give them specific feedback. You are doing great at putting the things in your backpack and putting them by the door because it helps us when we go first thing in the morning, right? So that now I want you to remember to put your homework in the folder. <laughs> so, um, so those kinds of things that we always say two blows and a blow, right? Two positives and then something to grow on. Okay. Um, and then, uh, let's see, and then how you motivate. Um, we want to use positive reframing statements. Um, so, you know, a reframing statement could be if Jim says, "Oh gosh, I can't ever do my writing assignment. I just, I, I just don't know how to spell, or you know, I can't ever do this. I hate my teacher. You know, she makes my life miserable. Right? So, no control. So, so Joey, do you know how important it is to write? But like, Joey writes all the time. And I had to have a teacher like that. So let's just figure out what you can do. You know, sometimes your own prefrontal cortex needs to be sort of um, smooth before you have to work with somebody else's that are kind of going flipping out. Um, so you also need to monitor yourself before you get into those kinds of um, engagements and, and motivation statements. Um, Pre-MAC principle is named after David Pre-MAC, a psychologist in 1965. Basically, what it is is that you have um, you use the desired behavior as an incentive to gain more of the behavior you want to see, right? So that's up to you in terms of the values that you have in your family. Some people use okay, you can use the phone, you can have screen time, right? So build it along with your family values, um, and then then that way it's consistent. 
that make sense? Um, and then many rewards and incentives. I get my paycheck, so I have to. I want to go to work, and you know, I go to work so I can get my paycheck, <laughs> right? And so we want to incentivize, and extrinsic motivations are really good for now. And then uh, when they get mastery in it, they see intrinsically mm -hmm. that it's a good thing. So you want to model all of that as well. You know, motivation theory is like another six months worth of classes, and so I think that class is really cool. So, what time is it? 7.30. So here's an example of how um, we can use the schema to create your own intervention, okay? So looking forward to what you guys have to do in the next maybe 10 minutes, because I've been told to stop at 7.45 for your questions. Um, if you have any questions. Um, activity four, page eight and nine, and nine and nine, <coughs> walks you through how to identify a skill, whether it's emotional control or it's an, or sustained attention or a task initiation. I can get like an our example here is Lisa just has a difficult time starting her homework project. So if that's the skill that you want to cultivate in your kiddo, you want to put that, right? Task initiation. Does that make sense? So it's got to be one of the 11. And I say one of the 11 because it breaks it down, right? The video from Harvard talked about three main things. But if you took those 11, we can really organize them in those two buckets. Does that make sense? Yep. So, if, you, if the, the more specific you are, the more intentional and the more the results are clear. Okay. Um, so for Lisa, mom wanted her to initiate doing the homework on her own. So that's her behavior objective. Does that make sense? And then for environmental adjustments, if we look at Lisa's mom and what she did, let's take a let's just let's just read this, right? Lisa, age nine, had a very difficult time starting her homework promptly at the time her parents set for her right after dinner. So her parents decided they needed to teach this as a skill. Every day when she came home from school, her mother sat her down with her and made her out a homework plan. So she had a routine of two. Lisa made a list. Um, of her assignments, and she wrote down what she was starting to. She was allowed to build in a break for one TV show, so there's your motivation, right? <laughs> and then when is it time? When it was time for her to start her homework, her mother pulled out her homework flyer and asked me to take a look at it. She said, "Got it out," um, and her mother made sure she got off the good stuff. In the beginning, Lisa praised her for. You know, allow Lisa's mom plays for allowing her and following her schedule. So this isn't an overnight thing either, right? So you gotta the key the key to success to this is that habit building period. Like we go to the gym one day and then we don't take the next step because then we're not sure about it. Then you gotta fade the feeling. It, you know, in, in teachers speak, it's like fading the result, right? So it's transferring the accountability to the student. Um, and then if it's not quickly, it's, if it's not quickly successful, then the institute will send it system. So there are some more environmental modification um, suggestions here um, for that. But let's see, so it's like 35. Let's just have a, you know, give us maybe three minutes to just kind of jot down what you think you want to work on at home, right? What executive function skill you came here for a reason? Right? So we're, I'm gonna unpack that for you. So what what is it that you want to work on at home? Is it organization? Right? Is it task initiation? Working memory? So have a look at that and just make sure that, that um, you're writing that down. And it could be as simple as instituting um, one of those suggestions on the Harvard University connection. And as simple as that, or maybe placing an organization system, um, a folder system at home, and then teaching the listening to your child. Because sometimes what it helps me is, you know, because my brain isn't used to reframing some positive statements, 
I just didn't have the vocabulary to, you know, to be able to think when I'm upset because Jane, you know, my son didn't do his homework or whatever, or get an email from the teacher. So, you know, err on the side of non judgment, and here are some sample scripts. And Dawson and Jars both have a lot of them. So, my suggestion is to really purchase this book. I have it on. Um, I have it on e-text also, <laughs> so when I have a computer, I have the book with me. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. Okay, let's read that side down. Um, it's a really great book. It's um, Executive Skills in Children and Adolescents. It's actually um, in the back of your, oh, here. Okay, just, just pass it around. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, so I want to share out what goal they have, what role, what task that they want to improve upon in their home. Yes. Um, for my child to practice their, their instrument every day. <laughs> so with task initiation, right? It's task initiation. Right. So what's queuing system? What you know, maybe you want to remove the computer out of the way or the tempting things that would stop your child from practicing, right? Putting a calendar that says, if you practice on your own without queuing from me, you'll get a star, and then maybe we'll go out to in a while. That, we've done that. That breaks down in our house. Oh, okay. So that's not a good one. So good. Yeah, so let's, all of that incentive stuff, it just becomes a disaster. Okay, so those are things that then you got to figure out, okay, so my kid is really smart, <laughs> you know, I am the smartest kid, right, to figure out how. Um, there are some motivation techniques like the, I, the theory of future selves, um, like who do you want to be or what the what identity pieces, um, what, what are the narratives that you want your child to have, who are you? Right. At the high school level, so I've had for a long time, but now I'm in high school, I've had a lot of kids saying, Dr. Wolf, I am dyslexic. I just cannot read. And I said, wait, so if you are dyslexic, then you will always be dyslexic? I don't think so. But that's an enabling, that's a fixed mindset that they have. And so whatever you feed, that's the one that will win. Right? There is so much research right now, the mindfulness and mindset research right now, on how what that impact is on the brain and how it improves the brain is amazing. Ellen Langer from Harvard, Clockwise is her new book, Counterclockwise. It's it's about what you said, what your intention is, that's what comes out. Yes. Um, you say that my son attended the charter school, and at the beginning of this year, the children set focus learning goals in a variety of subjects. And I found the last two years, I've printed out mm -hmm. each of my son's goals. I actually have to type, I type them out, you type right. them, and I paste them on his wall in his right. bedroom so that you can repeatedly have <coughs> yourself and your child see what they're actually working towards. And that, that helps because if you just say it and you don't see it and then take the steps to, you know, realize in your mind, yes, there, there's a point yeah. that this is why I have to do this repetitive right. year. Yes. So, so oh, I don't know if it's the same school, but our school does too. And one of the great things about that is what she said is the student mm -hmm. that needs the focus learning goal. So yeah. if they want to learn to study instruments or if they want to learn to do something, it's different than if. I want them yep. to learn. So mm -hmm. that that self empowerment yes. helps us. You know, right. And there are times when I was three years old. That's when I started playing the piano. My mother just said, "You need to practice. You need to practice." And I hated every minute of it. Right. But sometimes you just need to do it. You can't fake it until you make it. And I'm so happy that she wanted me to you know do those recitals because I can play the piano. Right. So sometimes we don't know and we don't want to. Again, shut it down, right? Fight, fight, please. We don't want to threaten the student, right? There's a lot of data on this thing called ACE, ACE, Adverse Childhood Experiences. 
And so when they, when our, when children experience a whole set of adverse childhood experiences, their level of resiliency goes down. Their executive functioning goes offline. Um, and it's not good in terms of projections longitudinally. Um, there are studies out there. Yes, ma'am. So, uh, is there functioning specialized? Right? In, no, it's not specialized. Or you could say in special, because we may have other languages, right? Uh, or other language environments, or et cetera, right? So, I, I see a lot of it, it's very verbal, right? And if that is one of the hurdles you have, how do you still work on all these goals? That's a, that's a great question. So the question is, the assumption is that executive functioning is a special ed, special education, and that, um, let me just repeat, make sure I understand your question, um, and that um, if executive functioning is about more verbal cueing, how do you, what kind of goals can you set um, that are non-verbal, right? To so make, what I'm trying to ask is, how do you work with a kid who may have some language impairment, mm -hmm. and you still want to work on all these, all these functions <coughs> because the child still has it. You yes. know, he, he still has the intelligence. You want to work with him, yes. but you have these hurdles where you, you can say all these words, and but you may not be understanding all of them. You know, you understand yeah. it. So exactly. how do you work with the, So how do you work with the kid with language impairments? Yeah. Right. So language impairments. Um, in my world, it's receptivity, so expressive and, and um, receptive language. So when students have auditory processing or when they have the inability to express what they know, um, those are two different interventions or cueing systems. So if there are language impairments, you want to create a visual cue and then explain it very short in short spurts and then say okay so now pretend like they're teaching me the routine <laughs> how should i do it now we model together i do we do and then you do does that help mm -hmm. um and it depends again on the task that you want to do but with language impaired students um really you want to do the but visual, graphic organizers. Um, you also want to cue them too because neuroplasticity, if you never cue them, it's never going to create those pathways, right? So multi-sensory, have them do it, right? So when they can teach you, they know it. Does that help? Um, and I also want to clarify that executive functioning, there's a difference between weakness and disability, right? So if your child has, has been diagnosed with attention deficit, hyperactivity, yes, they will have some executive functioning issues. Um, and so on top of the regular interventions, these are like tier one universal interventions that you can do. But when your child is diagnosed with attention deficit, you want to work with your physician and say, what are some things I can do at home to cue them? More than likely, those cueing systems routines and then explaining to the child that, okay, there's a little bit of a change in the routine, this is what'll happen, right? And of course you can't always predict, but you know. Um, and then let them feel it, right? Let them feel the emotion and the frustration, mm -hmm. and maybe the goal is the recovery. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So, um, is there a sequence developmentally of, of uh, a structure of what sh they should, what skills they should, have and could there be an arrested development? So if they don't develop mm -hmm. this, then they can't develop this um, in the later years. Is there kind of a sequence where we can go through and say, you know, much of where uh, the victims of domestic violence, mm -hmm. and so now we've got we've got some holes. They're achievers, but we've got some holes. So do I need to go back and say, okay, this is what was not achieved, what was not acquired here, and go back and acquire this before I can build upon? Okay, so Veronica's question is, is there like a linear linear approach or a progression of skills within the 11 that we had mentioned? No. Um, because, it's, because the system is integrated, I like to always harness the emotional safety, right? So safety, to safe space to be brave, right? So learning is a risky thing for a child. So when you send them off to school, and they're surrounded by 25 other kids that they don't even know. 
And they don't actually know that the other kids bullying with me, you know, that kind of thing. And sometimes they can't read those social cues. They, that's a childhood, uh, that's an adverse childhood experience, right? And so that will determine some delay in the growth of one of those executive functioning skills. Right? Um, does that help? Yeah, that's probably like three questions in one. Yeah, yeah, I know, and I think that's a, but we just take a look at one thing and then, and then look at the child, child smiling, happy, well, like right, doing a great job. And then, you know, rest in that success, right? Anyone else? Yes. Um, for working memory, to me that just seems like such a hard thing to work on. What are your suggestions for the practical things you can do to work on that? Um, yeah, so working memory is tough. And, and I'm also, another book that may be good for those, like more of the academic pieces, is Henry Roediger's book, Make It Stick. And it talks about the research on learning strategies and study habits. Um, and the assumption is that, um, so the assumption is that when you're learning a new thing, a new concept, practice every day, right, in a novel way. So you need to tax, to strain the brain, find that proximal zone of performance, not too hard, not too easy, but just in that zone, and practice it for short spurts of time. And then it'll be automatic, right? So that's the bottom line of who, what, when, and where. That's in the Bloom's taxonomy of, of comprehension. So that's the who, what, when, and where. You need those basic skills so that you can actually evaluate, analyze, and then create. Does that make sense? So practicing the new skills and, and then um, pinning them into knowledge schemes that they know. So analogies are great. It's kind of like this. Remember when you did this? That's the same concept. Oh, okay. Visuals, right? That'll, that'll really cement it. And then show it in a novel way two days later. So there's an interleaving of information that becomes, that it goes into long-term memory so that when they have those basic kernels of information, they can start to create. But they can't create if they're not emotionally stable. Are there video games that work on all this? <laughs> <laughs> yes, but um, yes, um, and luminosity, those kinds of things, you know, they, they're after nowadays, right? Um, but the other piece too, yeah, and, yeah, do you have, it's the, can you show it? Those are, there's some video games on there, there's apps on there. Um, Nothing takes the place of a real human business, right? Because you want to be that apprentice, you want to apprentice the kid. You want to be the cognitive apprentice. That's another motivation theory, a learning theory, that says, I'm going to model how I want you to learn. And then I'm going to observe you. And I'm going to talk to you about what you think you learn. Why do you think it's important? Why do you think it's important to sit and listen and pause to your, you know, when your friend is talking to you, right? Because there's no left for that, right? So, yes. Um, I thought your comment about incentives, looking at your future self, was amazing. Where do I get other tools, like incentive tools that aren't the star chart, but like, hey, do you want to be a musician or not? It's under the motivation. It's under the motivation theory. Okay. Um, you know, the narrative, the identity pieces, who do you want to be, um, who do you, um, like all the mentoring programs um, that I, and what mentoring classes that actually work with us when I was at the charter school, or the first generation college goers, I mean, those are the kinds of met the motivation things that they put out. Like, who are you, um, who, who is the, like, your most influential figure, right? Um, yes. You said the book and motivation? It's a, it's is, a, is there a good book and motivation? Do you recommend yeah. reading for children? Yeah. You know what though? Daniel Siegel, how do you know you know the like Dan Siegel's Yes Brain is amazing. Yes Brain? It's amazing. It's great. I mean he doesn't use executive functioning in the book, but it's all about executive function. And it's all about being compassionate towards yourself because parenting is hard. 
right? We always think that we're, we, we're super responsible and we are responsible and we want to guide them and help them integrate their own neural circuits because we won't always be there for them. So by, by working on our own integrated neural circuits, our own executive functioning, we're going to see what, you know, gets us up here or gets us down here or just, oh, I agree. Okay. Yes. I have a, um, I have young kids and I have a teenager. Do you recommend, I've seen an executive functioning workbook. Do you recommend those kind of things for older kids to actually work through? Um, Yes and no, I think, I think it just depends on, especially for the older one, you need to get the older ones by in, right? Because when they're in high school, I'm telling you, they want to just be away from you, right? <laughs> you need to have, like, my son was probably, I was probably the best tutor for my son. But did you want to have anything to do with him? No. So I had to go pay another tutor <laughs> to help him with his reading, writing, and whatever else. And so sometimes you just need, you know, the best auntie or the, um, to help you, because it, it takes a village nowadays to raise these kids. Um, and, you know, CHC is a great community. You guys really have a lot of resources here um, and connections that you, and if you need any help, so we, and, you know, CHC can help with that. Um, I think one last thing before we have to close call. I love this, um, the one you see. That's actually a podcast, too. <laughs> um, so Sharon Salzberg actually um, interviewed Dan Siegel about Yes, Brain, and he's got a new book coming out called Aware. Um, I'm all over Dan Siegel right now because I was just with him um, at Multiversity um, in Scotts Valley. Great, great person around executive functioning and parenting. There's a lot of parenting workshops. But really, the one you feed went. Right? We're always negative. <coughs> Following a mammalian brain, then your child's going to come back. But be kind to yourself because it's a process. It's a process. So, just my, it's a stepping stone, just my quick thing. Just when you're doing these things and you're putting your interventions there, observe. Don't judge. Oh, you're doing this thing again. I can't believe you didn't practice your instrument again. I can't believe it. You're a you're okay, right? Like, no. Like, 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 freeze here. Um, create the space for the development to happen. Um, and the whole building bridges piece is really critical. Did you know your child? <coughs> and you want to communicate with the teachers so that the teacher can see the child and implement who the child is and create that environment for your child. And then work with other parents to get um, the, just those integrated neural connections really lighting. And those are some other references. I'll be around if you have any. Do we have any other questions? I have no questions. Oh, yes. I think that we need to explain about the relationship between the specific executive function and self esteem because. Self-esteem. So, like, I have self -esteem, yeah. elementary, high mm school. -hmm. And what I'm more concerned about is not necessarily him getting his homework done, but him being confident enough to make good choices and not do dumb stuff and really hurt himself. And I'm wondering if there's any anybody's really looked at which of these help you be more confident and more comfortable with yourself. Yes. Um, so, the, so the question was, are there any research out there to increase confidence and esteem, right? And to make good choices, that leads to good choices. Well, well, well specifically with regards to the executive function that we've been talking about tonight. So Dan Siegel talks a lot about the, those things around um, understanding the emotions and recognizing the emotions and identifying them, and then kind of sitting with those emotions. Um, and there's a tool on his website too, so you might want to just take a look at that. It's, it follows the mindfulness approaches around that, and so there's a lot of research around um, pausing and um, doing and redoing the narrative so that when I can pause, I can see what's in front of me and look at the choices without like having some of those issues or fear issues right up so that it'll lead me to the right to the optimal choice. Um, but there's also research on failure, like gift of failure. 
um, great, great book as well. And like letting them fail and learn from their mistakes, that's that's a way to create many, many more pathways too. We've all made mistakes, right? And then we've learned from them and we don't do them again. And so by shielding our, our kids from those mistakes, we may be doing them a disservice. Um, Julie Lipkoff Haynes, The How to Raise an Adult, great book also. So, but let's just start with this one. Just, just stick to one and then and see how most likely to when the students see the positive results, they know inside of them that it's a good thing. And I think that's where this, the whole mindfulness research is coming up now on social emotional as well. That when they have their own cueing system in their body, they know that this is the right path. And having them feel the negative consequences will more than likely steer them onto the right path. Yes. You had a couple of, you said you had a favorite podcast, which one? Oh, um, the one you see. The one you see. That's what it's called. Okay. Yeah, the one you see. Okay. You were mentioning about how important contrasts, graphs were, mm -hmm. and creating mindsets. And I was wondering if there were any, um, it sounds like you worked a lot on yeah. the presentation, if there's any specific resources you would recommend, like if there are. On how to do them or how to make them? Or like if there are programs that can help like, make that easier? Like, how do we get started? Are there, are there, Libraries or you know a, a library that Yes, 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 yes. Um, my go-to, which is what I use for my 200-page dissertation, is Inspiration.com. Yeah, okay. That's a great. But do not just give it to the kid because then they'll start playing with the pictures, and that's not the point. Um, so that's a great one online. It's on Webspiration too. Those are great things yeah. to have. Women often. Yes. Given that you know Brown Lowe's are kind of thought of as you know where the executive functioning happens, what we discussed, and that they're sort of the last in and first out. So the question was, which of the executive functioning skills are really more developmental, and you can't really teach it? Um, so the research, again by Richie Davidson, talks about the four tenets of well-being, and that there's one of his tenets is that you can make basic goodness in every human being. And then there's a there's a study that actually set two different kinds of puppets in front of a kid, and and the one puppet was in a different color, um, helped one student, and I mean one character, and then the bad puppet um, didn't help. And when showed in a different at a different time which puppet the kid would want to take, the kid chose the nice puppet. Okay. And there's an, a tendency for students, for children to want to help, right? And there's something along the childhood experiences that shut that down. So I think for me, the most important skill to teach is the emotional regulation first. Because if that amygdala and the limbic system are not in stasis, then you can't really activate the prefrontal cortex to organize the task initiate to prioritize because he's in fear. They're just ready. So that's a lot of the social emotional piece that's coming up, and I think that's what's so sad. And in, in the in old psychology, the, the traditional look in psychology is that the mind and the body are not connected. And that if something's wrong, it's because you're thinking about it, right? But if you're not identifying the emotions that go with that, and then you're not reacting in a more positive way, and you're not training it that way, then human beings would always go towards fight, fight, fight. So, so let's say you have a student or a, a decent population of kids with ADHD, mm -hmm. like a story, right? oh. um, and that, that self-regulation For Healthy Mind, um, which is um, website, there's research that shows 
when you teach students with ADHD or people with ADHD to pause, right, and reflect, and and really go through a routine of um, ex via that experience, the attention and the focus increases, and it's actually um, measured in like, GRE scores and grades. And so when you teach them to pause and to pay more attention to certain things, the working memory goes up too. Um, the and GRE is what? It's, it's a graduate. So let's say we're talking about elementary. So mm -hmm. the elementary piece, there's a, a kindness curriculum out of Gucci's um, website as well that teaches them how to pause. Um, so take a look. That's an open, that's an open source um, curriculum that anyone can access. Richie Richard Davidson Center for Healthy Minds. Yeah, cut me off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> so uh, yeah, thank you for coming.